Me hamocha. True existence. This is my mother of Marash, which at least each time we talk about it, perhaps we on our level are we're cleansing the air, spiritual cleansing of the air. The general idea of this one is that we're looking at the versification of Mi Chamocha Be'el Hashem, Mi Chamocha Nedeb Kodesh, who is like you among the Elim, a Lord who is like your splendid and holiness. Now we're trying to figure out what does it mean the Elim, who's like you among the supernal creatures, is what we kind of ended up interpreting it as. So among all the higher beings, no one is like you. And it's not just no one is like you, there's no existence other than God. We have our commentators that tell us that. Now we say, nothing else exists except for God. God himself told us that the world was created. Rachel Bar Elokim, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we all noticed Elokim, that's the name of nature. So you want to talk about creation, it's using that name. It doesn't use the name of Avaya, it's the name of Elokim. So we say, okay, who is like you among all the supernal beings, all the great beings? There's only God that exists. However, we know that a world exists. Now we're trying to figure out, God created the world. Idolatry is out. That's saying you can't have anything that's equal to God. Is there such a thing as what we call the partnership, the shit of? Did God perhaps create a world, then create all these lower level deities who are now empowered in their role within creation? It's not just that they're a channel now. Like the sun is a channel for photosynthesis and growth and vitamin D, etc., etc. But does the sun also have a choice about shining or not? So that's what it, did he create all the deities? That's kind of what I mean by that. Does an angel actually have a choice? If God sends the angel on the mission, does the angel have his own discernment? Or any of the supernal beings, the sun, the moon, the stars, etc., do they have a choice in this power that's being passed through them? Does the rain cloud actually decide rain? Because if the rain cloud decides rain, then we can say, oh, mighty rain cloud, give us your rain. There's a question about that. Spoiler alert, the conclusion we're going to come to is that we don't believe in that either. There is only God. We've looked at the writings of a lot of different sages about the general idea of what does it mean to only believe in God. And it's a fundamental principle. And it's something that we mean it not on a general, but at a literal sense. But the other thing we went through is looking, the world is created and there's still a lot of dimensions to the world. And not just that, there's a lot of spiritual dimensions to the world. Even when we're talking about angels are so great and mighty and look what they could do, they're still created beings. They still come second. There's still God alone in the world. At least we know to some extent they are subservient to him. But again, the conclusion is that they're absolutely subservient to him. Talking about how we have the different sages and the way they interpret that we have to believe in the onlyness of God. Part of that we see in the Shema, God is one. You mean that literally there is only him. And even though there seems to be many, there's only him. He is the oneness of all the multiplicity. It's all within him. There's nothing that exists outside of him, etc., etc. We revisited some of what we saw before from the mimer that we did of the Shemam, Avai Elkeinu. One, singular, one of the many, etc. Talking about what it means that God is one. We talk about that our job is to bring the oneness into reality. The Jewish people, our job is to bring that name of Avaya, to bring this great name that's above all. Not just great, these aspects of God that's just above all creation, bringing it into creation, revealing within creation. He gets into the whole thing about the different layers of the firmaments, the different heavens and what exists in all of them. Now, okay, we return to this already, but we return to it again. The question is asked, where does the earth come from? From what was the world created? So it says, God took the snow from under his throne of glory and he threw it down into the waters and that became the dust of the earth etc what do you mean did we say that there was creation what do you mean? where did the world come from god created it no 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 he took snow and threw it down and became dust but where did the snow come from what are these questions why are you even asking this question we know that god created everything then we ask the question again of where did light come from oh god wrapped himself in the white towel so that's where light came from again what is this question god said let there be light and there was light we don't have to start making these stories about a talus being a white talus that he wrapped himself in both of these are what we're going to revisit now. That's what we're going to get to. But before we got to that, we went into a whole thing about what does it mean that we say God created? Why is it giving these answers about snow and tals and whatever? So this is the whole idea about there's not a blade of grass that doesn't grow unless there's an angel that hits it and it says grow. The general idea of everything having a spiritual source. In this physical world, we see it manifest as something physical within creation, but there is a spiritual source for it that actually feeds down to the physical form. It gives life to the physical form. Where did I just see this? There's an idea we spoke about in chapters 18 and 19. It comes up again about the hidden love that we have in us. Part of our DNA that we have it from our forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov so gave themselves over to God that their love, their dedication, etc. became intrinsic to Jewish person, part of our DNA. It says, how do we know? Why are we so certain about God's existence, let's say? Okay, we know we have the hidden love, but what's feeding it? So it says because of... Oh, maybe I saw it here. Well, if I did see it here, we'll get back to it. So why are we so certain about it? Because our spiritual source sees and experiences godliness because up in the spiritual realms godliness is more evident this is what we spoke about in later chapters of Tanya talking about when we say higher and lower we mean where there's greater revelation versus lesser revelation so it's not geographically higher and lower when we say something's more holy it means it's more revealed your spiritual self your spiritual source senses godliness in a much greater way than the physical body does your spiritual source knows that it's true it knows it it's trying to send the signal down to the physical body I'm telling you I've seen it it's real I'm experiencing it that's part of where our certainty comes from kind 
kind of connection that we have, the kind of vibe that we're getting, part of what lends to the certainty of like, of course this is true. I might not know what the truth is in all its aspects, but I know it's true because there's a certainty deep inside of me. Where does that come from? Your spiritual source, which knows, has this knowledge. So then we, we spoke about the angels that let's say they have short life and this is like the foliage and the angels that are made to maintain the world, things like that. How can you say that the plants all made this decision not to crossbreed while, what do you mean? The blades were talking to each other like, hey blade, what's up? Blade, 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 look there's leaf. He's Scandinavian. Where do they get the power of speech from? So it's not the blades that necessarily speak to each other. It's the source angel what speaks. Then we got to the whole thing with the rooster. It looks like a one thing in our physical realm and the higher realms, it's the angels. The awakening that happens with the rooster at midnight when one day turns into another looks different in each of the worlds. And then we did say fairy Karm. Who's ever Joseph Abba, I think. He talks about that believing in creation ex nilo, which is what we call in Hebrew yeshmi ayin. It's a fundamental aspect of belief because even if you have spirituality that evolves, evolves, evolves. So you have Malchus thing and then it becomes Angel Gabriel. You can't get a rooster from that. How do you make the leap from spirituality to physicality? You can't. How do you get a rooster? Where did the physical object come from? You're not even dealing with physical matter. Spiritual matter to evolve, evolve, evolve. That makes sense. You end up with a different spiritual matter. But spiritual matter can't create a physical matter. Physical matter could evolve, 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 and you end up with the next thing. But you can't even go from physical to spiritual. How does that work? We say the only thing that can work you can't do without the God factor. The God factor bridges the gap, creates the link between spirituality. But somehow, once it's evolved, 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 now we can jump to physicality. It talks about how just the fact that we can conceive it, and we know that something like this is true, etc., shows that it's as true and that it's possible. That goes through all of it. We're returning now to what it speaks about with the whole thing with the snow. It goes back to the question. Now that we've seen this whole thing with creation ex nihilo, you have to make the jump, etc. So we look again from what was the earth created. So we took of the snow or ice, which was beneath his throne of glory, and threw it upon the waters, and the waters came congealed, so that the dust of the earth was formed, as said, he said to the snow be earth. It's from Eve, the book of Job. What does that mean? He took snow. What on earth is going on here? On the level that we're interpreting things and looking at things now, when we're looking at snow, we're not going to translate it in the physical sense of snow snow like we know. So we look at the word snow in Hebrew, sheleg, shin lamed gimel. You know, gematrias, that each one has a numeric value. Shin is 300, lamed is 30, and gimel is three. What are we looking at? Shin is factors of hundreds, lamed is factors of tens, and gimel is a factor, is a unit factor. It's almost like saying ones, tens, and hundreds. Now look at what we're gonna do with this, because this is so deep. Here what it's showing is that the world was created from units, tens, and hundreds. What does that mean? Wait for this. If you look at the chart here, units brings us to what we call malchus. Malchus we're familiar with, kingship. That's where everything gets channeled through it. So you have all the, the other, what we call spheros, all the other levels. In a human being, these are our attributes, motive powers, but they're mirrored that each world has these. All of these exist in each of the individual worlds. The world is created with sheleg. Malchus is a bottom level. That's the level of ones. Everything gets channeled through it. We have what's called za, zer ampin, literally means the small face. That's all the motive attributes. Chesek, vurit, fres, it's these six. Kindness, severity, compassion, endurance, humility, foundation. They're all considered one category because they're all emotive faculties. On man, that would be the torso. Well, mainly the torso. So za is tens. Above that is mochin, which is the mind. A moach in Hebrew is a brain. So mochin is the mind. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, intellect. That's hundreds. You guys remember from the last my Merve Hecharim, there's something called Keter crown because the crown goes above the head. That's will and desire. Will and desire is what dominates everything else. It dominates your entire body, your mind and your emotions and everything. Will and desire rules over everything. Doing this numerically, we got ones, tens, hundreds. Keter then is thousands. And then we have the emanator, the God factor, where it starts coming, the light starts coming down from. That's ten thousands, tens of thousands. Where do they get it from? We actually have proof text. No sir chesed alafim. Does that sound familiar? Hashem, Hashem, kalachum, vichana. God, God, compassionate and righteous in His justice, etc. It's the thirteen attributes of mercy. That it the verse is no tzar chesed lalafim. You know, Kippur, you say it probably like 17 times in a row. It keeps going back to it. No tzar chesed lalafim, preserving loving kindness for thousands. Elef is a thousand. The first word, no tzar, but you don't put the hole on there, it becomes a vav, that's the vowels. So it's the same letters as ratzon. I didn't put a final one there because I wanted you to see that it's the original letter. Ratzon means will and desire. That's how we know that keter, which is will and desire, is thousands. Can you imagine you're learning Torah and you see this verse and you're like, oh, I know what this means, keter. We talk about Torah giants. We're not talking about the average person. Then it says here, more versifications. One's from Tehillim, one's from the Book of Devarim. That's the Mirivas Kodesh. It came with some of the holy myriads. So myriads, many, manys. What's myriads? Rechav el Kimber Basayim, Hashem's chariot is twice 10,000. So God the Emanator is 10,000s. So it's taking these numerical numbers here and it's saying this is how the world was created. What does it mean by that? It's talking about the progression of the light. God is really in self, he's infinite. There's no number for it. But where we're starting from is the light of creation. This is compared to, symbolized, like taking the number 10,000s. The process of contraction, talk about this a lot, that we can't even compare the light that we have now to the original light. Think about the entire universe that we know and even the universe that we don't know. They keep setting more telescopes up there and they're like, oh my God, we always thought it was this, but there's gazillions. 
millions more than we ever imagined. And it is so massive. And we're like, wow, the world's big. The universe is so incredible. And everybody's like, there must be life. There must not be life. Blah, blah, blah. And each time it's just like, wow, well, massive universe, the Milky Ways and galaxies that we can't even fathom. We can't fathom. What we know as in the light of the universe as we know it is a tiny, tiny fraction of the ultimate light. It's so small, it's like one to infinity. This is our entire existence. For us, it's like, wow, so big, so muchness. You have like an entertainer come, like a juggler or a magician, and everyone sees a trick. And they're like, whoa! And you're like, I didn't even get to the finale yet. Just you wait till you see the ultimate trick. And we're like, wow, look at the light, it's so amazing. And it's like, you're getting excited with this? This is nothing. By showing these numbers, calculating that everything is a tenth, it gets so condensed that the light that goes to the next world is a tenth of the one before it. A way of understanding how the progression occurs. So it's talking about how much condensation, what word we use, how much condensing of the ultimate light occurs. And this is what we could come up with, that it's everything, imagine it condensing to a tenth of what it was before. So what's a tenth of 10 thousands is a thousand. And what's a tenth of that is a hundred. And a tenth of that is 10. A tenth of that is one. And then you can't break it down any more than that. There's so much condensing occurring. There's so much vacuum packing. There's so much of it getting dimmer and narrower and curtained that every world ends up with a tenth of what there was before it. So when we say the world was created with snow, we mean the world is created with a tenth of the tenth of the tenth. Because three is a tenth of 30 and 30 is a tenth of 300. And now you know how to give tithing. You make 300 bucks. You're welcome. That's why when you look at the original, we've spoken about this before, but when you look at not specifically modern Hebrew, but Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue Hebrew, almost no word stands by itself without having a deeper meaning just in the regular construction of the word itself. When you learn about that kind of stuff or anytime you see it a little bit, it's, it's crazy. Like <laughs> anything here not layered. Well, the answer is no. Everything is so layered, which is obviously part of God's genius that we can't even understand that. God gives us one word and there's like 4,000 things to it. And we're like, what is even going on here? Anyways, so when we say the world was created with Sheleg, here, especially when we're looking in the context of the Mimers are speaking about here, we're saying the world was created with the tenth of a tenth of a tenth, with these levels of the progression of condensing, all these gradations of condensing, that the 300 became 30 became three. So the ones and the tens and the hundreds and the thousands and the ten thousands. God himself, there's God the light that begins creation and there's God above creation. They often give the example when a teacher has to teach a student. You can't just give him your intellect, especially if it's someone who's younger than you or not as knowledgeable as you and whatever the subject is. You have to give them a nugget of an idea. I could tell you everything, but then you're just gonna be lost. So what I have to try to do is, is condense the subject matter to try to give you as much as you can understand. Now, once you understand a level, I can give you more than that. But if I try to give you everything at the same time, you're not gonna get it. The vessel, the vessel can't hold the light. Instead, I have to give you what you can hold right now. That's kind of the general idea, but we can't handle the light at the 10,000s level. So it has to be condensed, condensed, condensed until we get to the point where we're one. We got one from the 10,000s. And that's like, oh, now we could create the world. That's the power, the light that the world came about. That's the ones. And this progression happens through each of the world. That's how many levels of levels of levels occurs. The 10th thing process. It goes through the 10th thing process and then Malchus of that world will give over to the next world. And then it also goes through the 10th thing process. Then we can make the jump to physical creation. That's why it's one to infinity because we can't even fathom that difference of the light that's being condensed. It just goes to show that we talk about trusting in God. We have the ones and we're so worried about everything that's happening in the ones world. You're afraid to trust the originator of the original 10,000. He who is above that original number. I think he's got it. I think he can figure stuff out. I think he's kind of capable considering what the origin point is. Okay, so let's look at what it says here. Here it describes Berish Maharza, Beratius Rabbah. Commentator on Beratius Rabbah. I stated in Pirgad Rabbi Eliezer, so he's referring to another commentary. Chapter three. From what was the world created? This is what we just saw. This is the original verse that we're speaking about. From the snow beneath the throne of glory, which Hashem took and threw upon the water, became earth. Earth is written, he says to the snow, become earth. And as a scribe at length, in Shemot Rabbah 13, Hashem took earth from beneath the throne of glory, threw it on the water, and became earth. Small pebbles found within the earth became mountains and hills. Miles done. God just throwing snow. <laughs> he was having a snowball fight. And all of a sudden, boom, the earth came. <laughs> Here we are. That's a paraphrase. To explain, at the beginning of creation, the entire world was filled with water up until the throne of glory. God, on the second day of creation, what did he do? He split the waters. That's why the Hebrew word for heaven is shamayim. It means shamayim. There is water. There's water there. Remember Hebrew is so depthful. <laughs> to explain, at the beginning of creation, the entire world was filled with water up until the throne of glory. As said in Midrash Tehillim, Rabbi Brachia said, the water reached up until the throne of glory. As written, and the spirit of Hashem hovered over the face of the water. Second verse in the Torah. God created the heaven and the earth and the spirit of God hovered over the water. So this commentary is saying, it's not just that there was earth and then God hovered over the oceans. The water was so high up, it reached all the way up to the throne of glory. Literally, it talks about the spirit of God was hovering over it. It's like, oh, here I am, hover boat above the water. When Hashem was about to create the world, he froze the water and became like hailstones. He then crumbled them into thin pieces like snow from which earth and dust was formed. This then is meaning the aforementioned Midrash. He took it from beneath the throne of glory and threw it on the water, which refers to the snow that he crumbled into pieces, thin like dust. He also placed a large piece 
pieces within the snow from which the mountains were formed. Meditate upon the swell, how the words of our sages have a simple connotation, as well as the secrets hidden in them, although they are indeed profound. Basically, hidden depth. Here it's describing on a little bit more of a literal level about how we get this whole snow thing. The water was frozen all the way up to the throne of glory. And from there, God frozen and then he created the mountains and the pebbles and etc. But all of this is still talking about a little bit more on a physical sense. It's physical earth and physical creation we're talking about. From the spiritual sense and talking about spiritual sources, we still have to go through the spiritual progression before we can make the jump to a physical world. How does that happen? We learned part of this already that it happens through Malchus. Even as much as we're going to have in the next two sets of text both from later parts of Tanya, Shar Yechad Vemuna with the Nagar Sakodesh. These two sets are going to be talking about more what happens in the spiritual progression. We're kind of going back and forth between the commentators of no, even the physical we earth we had still went through a physical evolution, a physical progression in creation, but we still need the God factor to make the jump between the spiritual and the physical. So even if you're going to show, oh, there's many stages within creation between the spiritual going down to its lowest point and the physical starting at its highest point going down to its lowest point, the highest point of physicality and the lowest point of spirituality, they don't connect without the God factor. So as much as we're going to explain and we're going to look at all these verses and we find the, the greater depth within it, we're missing one piece if we don't believe about God making the leap, about God making the connection between the two parts. So it says, the name, capital N, the name that indicates the attribute of Hashem's Mahot, kingship, is the name of Adnan, Lordship. So Adon Olam is talking about God as the master of the world. Now that's the third name of God. Shem of Aya, the name of infinity. Shem El Kim, the name of nature. And Adon Olam, this is referring to God in terms of master and lord. For his kingship lies in the fact that he is lord of the whole universe. That's a different attribute of God. Thus, it is this attribute, Malcha basically, and this name, the name of Adnut, signifying lordship, which bring the world into existence and sustain it so that it should be as it is now, a completely independent and separate entity and not absolutely nullified. Because if you want to make a sun ray, you can't stay in the sun. You have to leave the sun for there to be a sun ray. This doesn't have to do with this, but it's connected to the thing I just said about the sun ray. This is from chapter seven of Shariah Chaber Muna. Basically saying, once we're going through all the gradations and the progressions, Malchut, kingship, is the one that creates the world. And it's a very simple reason. A king has to have a nation to have a crown. Or else, what are you king of? The blaze and all the leaves. Those are very subject. You have to be king over something. That's why Mahot is always considered the lowest level. The level that takes everything in and then goes to the next one. Because Mahot, it took everything in and now it's the top of what comes next. That's why this world is considered the world of Mahot. Kingship. God's kingship is most on display, most evident in this world. That we are servants to the master. This is such a side note, but that's what I was talking about. The sun rays and the sun and we don't notice it. It's only when you move away from the sun. That's when you can see individual sun rays. But you don't look at a sun and be like, oh, there's sun rays there. Tanya. Uh, I don't know what you, I don't remember. So that's what I was talking about. And then it said the point about you can't see sunlight anywhere else in space. Sun rays only exist because of the way our Earth's atmosphere contorts it, basically. But our Earth's atmosphere dust, it creates sun rays. It's so obvious, but I actually never thought of it before. <laughs> Mars doesn't get sun as far as what we know a sunlight to be. No, tell me I'm wrong. Mercury, which is all the way up against the sun, doesn't get sun rays. Only Earth gets sun rays. You ever think about that before? <laughs> earmuffs so the brain matter to explode. People think a world like this just banged into existence. You have a sun that's up there and there's however many planets. What number are we up to? They kicked Pluto out. Eight planets in the solar system. We all have the same sun. And Earth, as far as we know, is the only planet that gets sun rays. Somehow these exact molecules that would have the exact level of heat banged into existence a world in which there's eight planets and only one of them gets sun rays? And you think that's accidental? I don't know, it just happened. Funny how things work. It's so exact. And from all the worlds that exist, this is the only world that has plant life that gets fed by photosynthesis. There's no grass on Mercury. There's no grass on Venus. Saturn doesn't have grass. We're the only green planet. We're the only planet that gets sun rays. You think the whole world wasn't created just for Earth? Earth where God gave us the Torah? Anyways, that doesn't really have to do with this, but the sun ray thing reminded me of it. But what's the wrap up with this is that we're going to keep building the case and we're going to see it in the next text, which where it goes through the whole progression, describing how the progression occurs. All the 10 thing that occurs till we get to this idea of Malchus, the kingship is what feeds to the world that comes after it. And then it's going to go into the whole thing about white light and white talus, kind of like a some idea that we need a way for it to get down to this world. So it's crazy to think about how small we are. But then if you remember, this is also going back into the 30s chapters, God doesn't create something higher to serve something lower. We're units level, and yet the buck stops here. Once God created the physical world, okay, that's the end point of creation. All of creation is going to be realized in the units level. Why not the tens level, not the hundreds, thousands? It's amazing. And it's amazing to think about God bothered with us, and then God pays attention to everything that's happening on the units level. He wants us. He's just that into you. I just plugged my new class. He's just that into you. Anyways, how vast. The vastness of all of creation. Did I tell you this? I totally told you the story about the previous Rebbe, so he was arrested for communist for the heinous crime of spreading Judaism. He had a whole underground network. The, the 
previous rabbi kept Judaism alive in, in Russia and then our rabbi took it over. Also a whole clandestine network and people were disappearing. If anybody knows anything was going on in communism, so he was arrested. The communists were not nice. At one point they're trying to, you have to do your confession. You know how they used to do confessions from these people? They beat you, beat you, beat you. Confess! Someone would just say anything to just get out of it. So they put a gun on the table in front of him and they're like, you see this little toy here? This toy has frightened a lot of people before. This will make you talk. So the previous rabbi said to them, he said, this toy has frightened people that have many gods and only one world. But I have one God in many worlds. This physical world, now obviously it's a vital world. This is where we realize creation, but it's, it's not it. There's so much more going on in this universe than just this physical world. It's incredible. And we're part of it. We realize creation, but we're still just a tiny dot of it. It's I am dust and ashes and the whole world was created for my sake. Those two right there.